Hey everybody, it's Eric Torenberg, co-founder, partner of Village Global, a network-driven venture firm. And this is Venture Stories, a podcast covering topics relating to tech and business with world-leading experts. Welcome to the Village Global Podcast. I'm here today with Alex Denko. Alex, welcome to the podcast. Eric, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, it's been a, a long time coming. Alex, you have some opening postulations that you would like to introduce. Why don't we start with those? Sure. I figured coming on the podcast, it's not every day you get to talk to the whole village audience. Figured let's talk about something, you know, really big and important. Let's talk about scarcity and abundance. You know, this whole, like, what is the point of Silicon Valley? What is the point of the startup industry? Well, we are this industry that, for better or for worse, is like, all right, we are going to make abundance out of everything. We are going to put software into everything. We're going to turn everything into abundance. This is really interesting, right? I feel like we don't talk about this enough, actually, because it has some pretty interesting implications for the ways that we build the future, which is different, and also the end result of, you know, where economic rent gets collected. Who gets rich? Who doesn't get rich? How is that different than in the past? And how does it rhyme with the past? So I think that's really cool. And then second, I think that a lot of what is happening in Silicon Valley that's interesting is something that we call emergent behavior. And I think many of you are probably familiar with the concept of emergent behavior, but I'd like to talk about that a little bit too, because some of the most surprising insights and I think hidden gems of Silicon Valley behavior that actually explain a lot of the little things that we do you know, up in tech world are the outcomes of some really interesting emerging processes. So I guess some opening thoughts that I might like to talk with you about, Eric, is this idea of, okay, can we understand scarcity and abundance, not in terms of supply side resources or something like that, but rather as a function of emergent behavior of consumers and of markets? And two, how can we articulate the emergent behavior of Silicon Valley as the product of, you know, a super sum of a whole bunch of different parts when all of us come together and create, you know, something that we are experiencing today that's so new? Awesome. Let's get into it. Eric, I remember, so when we started talking a couple of years back, you had asked me for a reading list. And on that reading list, there were some, we were, we were trading some books back and forth. You know, you shared some good books you'd read, you'd read I shared some good books that I'd read. And one book that immediately came up you know, pretty quickly was, you know, what do you guys think think of zero to one? What do you think of Peter Thiel's point of view about, you know, everything? Uh, what do we think of Thielism, right? Is for, I'm going to guess that probably a lot of people in the audience have read zero to one. Uh, if you have not read zero to one, it's really interesting book. It is, it's a good introduction, I think, to the Peter Thiel school of thought, which is not, by the way, just be a contrarian about everything. Uh, I would actually call that as a very naive way to articulate the Peter Thiel school of thought. I don't need, I don't know Peter personally, but I have read one book, which like he says, and which I believe is the best way to understand the way that he sees the world and the way that he thinks about things, which is a book called things hidden since the foundation of the world Gerard. by Rene Girard. Yes. Yeah. Have you read that Eric? I've not read it. Oh dude, what are you waiting for? You should read that book. It yes. is excellent. Totally. Uh, it's very challenging, but it's very good. Uh, how does that inform his worldview? So Things Hidden Since the Foundation of the World is a very interesting book. It's a book about it's the human sociology and it verges into philosophy territory, but it's a book about the nature of conflict and how conflict leads to the emergent phenomenon of social order and the ability of humans to work together on things. If you know, if you know the opening of Peter's book, it says, you know, like, you should articulate your opinions in, of the format, most people believe X. However, the truth is Y. And I think you can probably sum up a lot of his thinking in the following way, which is most people believe that conflict is about difference. I believe A and you believe B. You know, therefore, we should fight. Actually, the truth is that conflict comes from similarity, not from difference, right? I want A and you also want A. Therefore, we must fight, right? And we use our differences as pretext for why we're fighting, but they're not the actual reason why we're fighting. Right, the actual reason why we're fighting, there might be some object in common that we are fighting for. You know, I want this food, you want this food, there's only enough food for one of us, so we have to fight. But the most interesting, and in many ways the most human kind of fighting, is fighting where there is no object at all, really. It's like, oh, I killed somebody in your family, so you have to kill somebody in my family, so I have to kill somebody in your family. It's this kind of like symmetric conflict. 
right? Where the conflict in some total is about nothing. It's just, we're fighting because we're fighting, right? It's very Shakespearean in a sense. It's, it's this idea of the intensity of conflict does not actually tell you anything about the value of what's being fought over, right? It only tells you about the intensity of the participants. That's all you can find out, right? So when you look at, you know, as, as, as Peter points out in his book, is when you look at business, right? There is a very clear form of conflict that we deal with, right? There are, in fact, two forms of conflict in the forms of competition, right? There's businesses who compete for customers, and sometimes on the flip side, customers who have to compete for the ability to buy what a business is selling if the business has a monopoly on it. And then on the other side of the equation, there's a less talked about form of competition that is actually equally important to the way the innovation economy works, which is competition in for capital, right? businesses and entrepreneurs need to compete in order to get capital. And on the other hand, capital may need to compete for the right to get into a business if it's a business that's really hot and interesting. So these two kinds of conflict, right, where it's saying the nature of the conflict does not actually tell you anything necessarily about the value of what's being fought over, but it does tell you something, which is about how much people care about it. And I guess finally, the last sort of tealism that we'll talk about today is this observation that he throws out in zero to one that has really sort of stuck with me ever since is this idea of if you want to understand what's going on, look at what lies people tell and then ask, why are they telling those lies? And it will take you to the truth very quickly. Yeah. You know, my question to you is how do you wrap them in, in scarcity and abundance? So I guess so first and foremost, you could say, all right, like, well, what is scarcity, right? Well, scarcity implies conflict. If there is a scarce resource, let's say that water is scarce, right? It implies that there are people who need to compete in order to get water. If there was so much water around that nobody felt the need to compete for the water, or if nobody needed any water and there was no reason to compete, there was no reason to fight for the water, then water isn't scarce, right? There's, there, there's not some scarcity. Scarcity implies conflict, and it also implies a kind of similarity. So this is, again, going back to this idea of, like, we don't fight over differences, we fight over similarities. Scarcity implies a similarity in the sense that there is a common need for something, or there is a common pursuit, or there is a common conflict, which, you know, together creates a kind of object for this competition, right? It creates a scarcity. Abundance, on the other hand, implies a lack of conflict. There is nobody is fighting over over something that is abundantly available because it is, it's freely and widely used, right? Everybody is using it and everybody is using it in their own way and nobody has to fight and nobody has to hoard the resource and everything is fine. I'd say as an example of an abundant resource, you know, think of connectivity, right, in the modern world. Bandwidth is not something that we hoard or fight over or obsess over for a single purpose. We all use internet connectivity each in our own way happily. Well, really, we all use it for the same thing. We all use it to watch Netflix. But <laughs> Netflix aside, you know, it's like we all, like, this kind of abundance implies a kind of difference and a nice harmony, whereas scarcity, on the other hand, implies a common similarity. Now, what tends to happen, you know, when something becomes abundant, as because of a technological revolution or something like that, is that new kinds of scarcity emerge, right? This is not a new thing. This is not unique to the software world. This has been happening for a long time. Right, you can think of in in uh, Nassim Taleb's book Black Swan. He has this example of a uh, musician, this guy named Giacomo, who makes money off of being a traveling musician. And sort of musical entertainment is scarce, so it's so long as there is demand for musical entertainment, people have to pay him because he's the only musician in the village. Right, so he can make a good living. And then comes the advent of recorded music. Right, so with recorded music, all of a sudden his voice and his singing ability becomes made abundant. Right, now you can just buy records; they can be mass produced, they can be played X number of times. So what used to be scarce has now become abundantly available. So Giacomo's out of a job, but the villagers in, this, in the town are very happy, right? Now they get to listen to better musicians for cheaper, for a wider variety of them. And a new scarce resource emerges, which is distribution. It's called, you know, the ability to access recording and access distribution and access marketing and things like that. And so this new scarcity was born, which was the record industry, right? So we went from one kind of scarcity into a poorly understood kind of abundance into a well understood kind of abundance, complete with its own new kind of scarcity that created a new kind of order around the musical world that then more or less hung together for the next hundred years until the internet, which, you know, is rearranging things again. It makes me question who's sort of the, the Peter Thiel foil. Is it like Mark Andreessen who thinks <laughs> like, or how do we, 
think about, I guess, the alternative viewpoint. Okay, so the Mark Andreessen versus Peter Thiel dichotomy of thinking is a really interesting one because, you know, if you look at Mark's point of view of, which is kind of, he's sort of the perennial optimist of tech, right? I think he's sort of earned this reputation, at least on Twitter, of being somebody who is very like, guys, like, we're all on the same team. We're all on team progress, right? Like, software is creating all these, you know, unbelievable things. And I think sort of Mark's point of view, where it overlaps with Peter's point of view a lot is somewhere really interesting, which is it says, you know, like technology is important, right? Because it lets us accomplish more with less. It lets us produce more, right? It lets us get more output for less cost. Eventually, you know, to the point where whatever output in question, whether it's transportation or communication or energy or whatever it might be, becomes abundantly available, right? And we treat it that way. And, you know, as we know, these technological bursts of progress do not happen in, you know, continuous linear ways, right? They jump in discontinuous messy bursts, and we call them S-curves, or we call them technological revolutions. And again, like, what's important is that, you know, at the end, some resource has gone from being scarce to abundant, and then we get this big rearrangement of the economy around that abundance, and new scarce resources emerge, and it's been happening for, you know, hundreds of years. Now, On this journey from scarcity to abundance, right, we have to answer two questions as we go from A to B. First question is, how is it going to work? You know, what's the technology? And the second is, who is this for? You know, the market. People say technology risk and market risk when they describe these things. But I'll let you in on a pet peeve of mine, actually. I don't like that, right? It's not risk. It's uncertainty, right? And so this may be being pedantic, but I think it's important. Describe the difference. Okay, so risk is something you can put a number on, right? So let's say we play a game, which is we're going to roll a six-sided die, and if a six is rolled, you take all my money, but if it's one through five, I take $10 from you. That's risk. I can actually calculate my odds. I can put a number on it. I can play the game in an informed way. Uncertainty is unknown unknowns, right? It's we have no idea what the game is going to be. We have no idea what's going to happen, right? There are unknown unknowns. I cannot put a number on it. So when people say... You know, like, hey, like, there is, like, I want to fund a business and there is some market risk involved, right? That implies we understand the market very well and we have a good sense of the probabilities of whether or not this will work. Market uncertainty, on the other hand, is this market does not exist, right? We hypothesize that it will exist as a result of the internet or something, right? But it doesn't yet exist, right? That's not risk. You can't actually, like, calculate that. So I I do think that's a very important difference. And the reason why it's an important difference, like the relationship that this matters for, by the way, is the relationship between investors and entrepreneurs, right, depends a lot on this subtle difference. If you look at sort of the history back of the innovation economy prior to Silicon Valley and prior to the software world, the fundamental relationship in the innovation economy concerned, on the one hand, you had financial capital, you know, which was controlled by investors. And then on the other hand, you had production capital, which was, you know, once that money gets differentiated into a factory or into, you know, some sort of technology or, you know, as we call it now, hardware, right? It's the thing that actually does the work to create some good or service. Now, you can sort of think of like a simplified path down the innovation economy where we're going to try to build a bunch of technology and get from scarcity to abundance where we've got three participants, right? This is super simplified. We're only going to consider, you know, capital and companies and customers. So normally when you like invest into building things, right, you have financial capital with your investors who are going to invest and differentiate itself into production capital. So it's like a a machine or into a factory or something in pursuit of economic profit in the future. The company then puts that capital to work, right? It builds something that does a job for customers. You know, it provides them with some good or service that ideally is scarce, right? So they can make an attractive profit off of it. And when scarcity is known and understood and the customers are known and understood, then financial capital can successfully underwrite the risk associated with spinning up this business, right? It's like, I invest money into you, you put that money into work selling some good or service, then customers pay for it, and then you generate me a return on capital. Capitalism is really good at this, right? Figuring out how to allocate resources and put them to work effectively so we can get the best possible outcome when we are rel- when we have pretty good information. But... Right. When there's technological uncertainty and market uncertainty, right, where it's, you know, we're inventing the future and we don't know what it is we're inventing. 
then we reach a point of failure where regular, like rational capitalism does not work. Now, so why does it work? It's like, well, it doesn't work because we have this problem if we're innovating sort of live and on the fly and trying to build the future, which is that more likely than not, like we're going to be trying to build things that are ambitious enough that we want to raise a little bit of capital and get started and learn, right? This is what we do in startup world now, right? You raise a little bit of capital and you build up and you learn and you raise some more capital and you raise some more capital. The problem is, and this is something we take for granted in Silicon Valley all the time, is that this actually makes no rational economic sense, right? To be able to fund these unknown things incrementally. So the reason why I say that is because let me give you, let me give you an example. So let's say, let's say it's 1870 and Eric, you come to me and you say, Hey, Alex. I'm raising money for a new railroad startup, right? Railroad is a hot new thing. We're going to build a railroad from San Francisco to Seattle because there isn't one yet. Here's my business plan. I'm raising $10 million to get started. So I read your business plan and I come back to you and I say, Eric, I read your business plan. It looks great. But unfortunately, I can't fund you. I can't fund this project because I know for a fact that there's no way you're going to be able to get the profitability on this initial $10 million of seed investment. And the truth is, we don't know how much money you're going to need on top of this. And whether it's going to be available for any reasonable cost when the time comes, right? I don't know if there's going to be, I can't give you series A if I don't know that series B is going to be there and we don't know how much it's going to cost. For me to invest into you now would be like me giving you a loan, knowing that you're going to have to borrow more money later on just to keep my loan good, right? I can't make that investment, no matter how magically fantastic the railroad might be when it's finished, right? I just can't. The only way I could fund this is if we funded the whole project all in one shot. But we can't do that either because we have no idea how much you'll actually need. And even if we could, the cost of that much capital is probably going to be too high for you to be able to afford it right now. Like, sorry, man. You know, like without being able to actually coordinate and communicate with the future, there is no way to incrementally finance a startup that is dealing with substantial tech or market uncertainty. And I say this talking about the past, right? Because something has happened where we have figured this out. Because clearly you could look around Silicon Valley and it's like we figured something out. Right. But this is something that people in modern day do not appreciate is that in sort of a regular economic conditions, none of this makes any sense. What changed that allowed this to, to happen? Ah, well, so I mean, I'll, I'll get to that in a second. Right. But I think that the first question you have to ask is, well, how did we overcome it before? Right. Clearly, we built stuff in the past. Like clearly we innovated in the past. Right. But sort of to, get, to give you a, a last metaphor, right, of what we're dealing with. Investing in innovation back then, it was like pushing on one end of a rope and trying to move the other end, where the amount of uncertainty involved, whether it's tech uncertainty or market uncertainty, is like the slack in the rope. Right? The more slack there is in the rope, the less I can know how much effort will be required for me to successfully move the rope forward. Right? So the more slack there is, the dimmer are going to be my underwriting prospects. Right? There are too many unknown unknowns for me to commit any resources. So we're at this standstill. Again, under normal economic conditions where everybody is acting rationally, we actually can't get around this obstacle, right? We have to content ourselves with funding projects that have a line of sight to being cash flow positive, or we have a line of sight to being profitable. So how do we break through the obstacle? It takes a very strong force to get through, right? Now, it can be the government. Very often, you will see the government actually just commit resources and say, this is important. We are providing non-dilutive capital. Like, we are going to fund this. And so, you know, this has happened a lot in the past. It's still happening in the present, right? Remember, it's like a lot of the computers and the internet got built off of DOD funding, among other things. It's still happening at enormous scale in places like China, right? It is actually pretty specifically in Silicon Valley where we've, you know, we've developed this attitude of like, oh, the government can't invest in innovation. You know, it sucks. It's like, no, 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 that's not true. The government's actually a really important player, you know, in, in this, in this scenario. But there is a second kind of positive of, of force, right? Here's where we're, we're coming around to this Peter Thiel point of view here. There is a second kind of force that can be really, really powerful, right? That is powerful enough to mobilize huge amounts of resources into projects where they have no rational business going. That force is conflict, right? It's we don't fight because we are different. We fight because we are the same, where the intensity does not tell you anything about the value of what's going on. In business, this fight is over scarcity. And in the innovation economy, we fight over future scarcity. So the name for this, as you might guess, are bubbles. It's when people start to fight, right? It's when investors start to fight to get into some new thing, right? There is some new story where it's like, yes, the, like railroads, like this is going to be the frontier of this magical new economy. 
or broadband cables are going to be the frontier of a new magical economy where there is some story that can unlock this behavior that gets people all around thinking, oh my God, this is it. This is it. I've got to get in. I've got to get in. I've got to get in, right? And you have a genuine bubble on your hands. Remember, by the way, it's like not every bubble is good, right? There are some bubbles that are actually really bad. Generally, I think you can divide bubbles into two categories. Uh, there's bubbles that happen when everybody believes that the future will be like the present. So this is like debt bubbles, real estate bubbles, 2008. Like these kind of bubbles are bad. The second kind of bubble is when there is this collective feeling that the future is going to be different. So these are like equity bubbles into technology, right? So like the railroad boom 150 years ago, the British canal boom 300 years ago, 1999 for that matter. So like the dot-com telecom boom. These are bubbles where everybody start all gets all excited because the future is going to be different from the present. These are the kind of bubbles we're talking about. So when bubbles get going, right, what happens is nobody knows the value of this thing that we're investing into, but everybody agrees that like it's important, right? People are like, okay, you ha- I have to get, I have to get into railroad stocks or I have to get into Broadcom. I have to get into pets.com or I have to get into Bitcoin for that matter. We'll talk about cryptocurrency a little later. What all these bubbles have in common though, is that they are led by this particular type of irrational, but very predictable behavior where everybody starts to behave in this way. We're like, all right, I'm committing my capital because I have to get in now because the price is going up. Now, if you, if you, if you take your, our, our Peter Thiel point of view, right? And you're like, if you want to understand the truth of what's going on, right? Look at what lie people are telling. Well, in a bubble, what's the lie? The lie is we are investing into the railroad boom. We are investing into broadband cables. As in, I am buying this stock in term, in hope of return on my capital investment. That's a complete lie, right? We're not investing. We're speculating. We're buying stock now in the hopes that the price will go up. What we're actually saying is, I'm buying this stock now because I bet that somebody else will be pay- willing to pay even more for it later. So if you look at, think about the equation, like a business is cost of capital versus return on invested capital. The bubble is entirely around cost of capital getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper because more and more investors are piling in saying, I'm willing to pay even more for it. I'm willing to pay even more, right? Investors are all in conflict with each other. And remember, right, the magnitude of the fighting, right, so how high the bubble is inflated and how cheap capital can get for all these entrepreneurs has nothing to do with this value of the prize, right, which is the return on invested capital will eventually generate, right? We've entered this very, very reflexive environment where everybody is just fighting to say like, oh, I bought the stock at 20 and this week it's at 30, so I'm going to try to sell when it's at 50, but if by next week it's at 40, I'm going to try to get out at 60, right? It's like, the actual value of the thing just completely leaves the picture. Everybody only cares about the price. So this is a very Peter Thielian environment, right? We are in an environment where conflict between people has escalated to such an extent that it has unlocked a sufficient amount of resources to funnel them into these entrepreneurs who can then go get to work building all of this stuff that otherwise would not be available to them. Otherwise, nobody would give them capital at that cheap rate. You would not be able to build all this stuff. Right. And again, of course, like bubbles crash, people all lose their money. People then scoop up the leftover infrastructure for pennies on the dollar. We rebuild, we consolidate, and this process, you know, recuperates, but now on much better ground to stand on. You have situations where it's like all the broke broadband that went bankrupt in 1999, 2000 got scooped up by people like Google for, you know, a couple of cents on the dollar. And now we benefit from the internet being super cheap as a result, right? It really sort of accelerated this to the point where we could actually get things into the hands of consumers, right? And then consumers could tell us like, yes, I am actually using this, right? But without this extremely inefficient conflict, all right, this needless conflict over nothing that drove this crazy bubble, we could never have gotten it. This, I think, sort of gets to, you know, before we talk about software, this critical overlap between the Mark Andreessen point of view of like, oh, it's like the, like the, our raison d'etre for what we do is to put capital into inventing the future and it is going to be great and don't worry about the stuff in the middle, like it's going to be good. Versus this Thielian, extremely cynical view of all human behavior reduces down to conflict and mimetic behavior, you know, find this really important area of overlap around people fighting and that fighting unlocking critical resources, which is what it takes for us to build the future. Rook, okay, you have to resummarize. What's the crux of the disagreement between the Thielian and Andreessen view? Well, um, I mean, I just think of the, I don't, I don't think there actually is a ton of disagreement about this anyway. Like, I think one is gets framed as like, Mark Andreessen, I think gets framed as sort of a, like a very positive optimist around of tech 
And it's like, oh, like all these ideas, we're going to try all these ideas and everything is an experiment and everything is forward progress and everything is going to go this way. Whereas the Telian worldview is really much more like all of these actions and all of the motivations behind us committing any kind of work or any kind of resources into, into anything is this sort of mimetic conflict driven behavior because we're just trying to get into things because other people are right. It's like, but again, there's this important overlap, which is even before we talk about software, right? It's like, this is important, right? It's an element of human behavior that in, allows us to build the unknown future, which we otherwise would not be able to do. Right. Remember it's like, in periods where everybody is sober and rational and calm, we can't build these big, impressive projects, right? We just can't, right? It takes a particular kind of irrationality for us to break through this problem. And this leads us to bubbles? Yeah, exactly. So, well, it's, again, it's like leaving the government aside for a second, which, again, we should never do because the government is always there and helping in all these ways. But it's like it's these financial bubbles historically that have been the catalyst to unlock all of this capital. Right, that allows entrepreneurs to go to work building this stuff. So there, for anybody who's really interested in this, by the way, there are two books that I really recommend. The first is a book called Doing Capitalism in the Innovation Economy by Bill Janeway. Bill is, Bill is fantastic. He is both an economics professor out in England, but also have, has been a practicing venture capitalist. He was with Warburg Pincus for a long time and has been on the winning end of many very successful VC deals. So he has both knows both the theory and the practice. He has wrote an amazing book called Doing Capitalism in the Invasion Economy, the second edition of which just came out. So be sure to read that. And then the other book is a book called Technological Revolutions and Financial Capital by Carlotta Perez, which also talks about this sort of boom and bust cycle at the macro level of how it talks about this sort of coupling and uncoupling between financial capital on one end who is trying to seek return. And then you have these entrepreneurs who are managing production capital, right? They make the actual machines and the actual factories and the actual, you know, like companies that do the real work of providing goods and services to people and how it's this interplay between the two of them that can lead to, you know, this big overinvestment into production during bubbles and then the resulting dividend that gets paid out to consumers once everything goes bankrupt and we scoop up the remaining assets and then we get to work building the future. But from this more fundamentally solid ground, right? At that point, we've actually figured out what the technology is for. We understand to a better degree how users want to use it. We understand what jobs to be done these users have, right? We're just in a much more, we've made much more progress relative to at the beginning of the bubble. So I guess what that brings us to is, well, all that's well and good, but what changed with software then? Because with software, it's like, remember how we went through this whole thing of like, we can't incrementally finance projects right the with 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 the investor dollars unless there's a crazy bubble going on we can't rationally like incrementally put money into these very speculative technological projects right unless there's complete insanity going on well it's like if that's true then one of two things must be true either everybody in silicon valley has gone crazy right for us to still be funding all these companies or two something has changed <laughs> right and you know at this point there's a little bit of column A, but I think it's mostly column B. Something has in fact changed with software that changes something pretty profound about how this all works. And I think so. What, what's special about software is two things. One is software as a method of abstraction. And two is software as a way of building networks. So what do you mean by this? Well, when you ask, like, what's an abstraction, right? Like, what is, what is it, so what is it software does? It's like, well, software on its own doesn't actually do anything, right? Hardware does the work. Software is just this ephemeral layer that sits on top of computers, right? Uber and Lyft is this layer that sits on top of the cars and drivers that actually take you places. Amazon is this ephemeral layer that sits on top of this giant third party marketplace and logistics and, you know, everything machine. If you go write some software, and you're like, okay, I'm going to create a new software company. I'm going to create a new software project. I'm going to create a new software idea. You're going to make it run on existing hardware and use existing stuff in order to, you, have, you probably have a hypothesis. You're like, I can think of a new job that people want done. I can think of a new use case for this existing hardware. Again, this is a very different kind of innovation than I'm going to build a new kind of factory that allows us to do more with less. Software is very different than that. Instead, it's I'm going. It's not I'm going to create a new mode of production that does more with less. It's 
I'm going to create a new way to serve customers and their jobs to be done with the existing stuff we have. I'm going to do it by building an abstraction on top of existing assets and existing hardware and existing modes of production, and then use that abstraction to use the customer's job. So, you know, I'll start with this computer. I'm going to write something to make it very easy for us to use a spreadsheet or video games or email. It's the same computer every time. The hardware hasn't changed. What I'm doing by writing software is making it easier for more users to do more things with it faster. Now, remember, it's like, at first, like, abstractions come at a cost, right? They are not a free lunch. An abstraction, so the people, the CS people will know this, like, abstractions are actually less efficient than something rigidly and efficiently purpose-built. Right. If you look back at the original sort of like, oh, I'm going to write like Unix and I'm going to write C as these general purpose programming language that will allow a computer to do anything, right, broadly speaking. It's like that is much less efficient than like a tightly wired, very perfectly calibrated machine. Right. There is a cost that you pay. Now, the benefit that you get is more users, more user friendliness, more total jobs being done. But it's the cost that actually drives the bus. Right. This is something interesting and underappreciated. The cost of this abstraction, it's like, hey, I'm going to expose it to more people. They're going to do more kinds of jobs, pulls the hardware, whatever the hardware might be, to get better. It forces that hardware to catch up, right? If this abstraction is really demanding and is slow and makes it crash, right? It forces the hardware to catch up and to differentiate and specialize to meet these use cases because customers are already demanding it now, right? They're saying, we have this job. Hey, make this, make this work. Like, I want this to work. I'm showing you with my behavior that this is not some theoretical market that you somebody might ought to build something for. This is a need that I have now. So what's happening is that software abstractions, when you just expose them to consumers, helps pull the hardware to get better from this ground truth first user-driven vantage point. The hardware makers don't have to guess at much at what they need to be building, right? There's still some unknowns, but there are a lot fewer unknowns. So the ultimate expression of this is Moore's Law. You know, everybody knows Moore's Law, right? This observation slash law that, you know, computing power per dollar, or however you want to express it, is going to double every two years. It's like, this has now happened for like decades on end, right? That, it should be impossible, right? Moore's Law should break some rule. What's actually happening is that Moore's Law, there's no law of nature that says that Moore's Law has to exist. What it is, is it's a positive feedback cycle that is reinforcing itself. It's saying, hey, here's a chip. I'm going to give this chip or this computer out to consumers. We are going to make abstractions that are more ambitious than we previously could, and those abstractions are going to expose it to more people and more use cases. They're going to break the hardware. The hardware is not going to be able to keep up, but it creates a market pull that forces the hardware makers to make better stuff, right, in order to meet that demand. As soon as you give it back to the consumers, you give them the next generation, we immediately take that increased performance, we write more ambitious abstractions, right, and we break the computers again. But it creates this pull. Right. This is why like computers are constantly getting better, but also constantly in a state of breaking. Right. For 50 years. Right. It's because users are creating this pull for hardware improvement. So I guess if you if you were to summarize this, this sort of in a in a sentence, it's that unlike before, where we were talking about you know these capital bubbles and ways of sort of like investors heard you know heard bubble funding innovation into existence, they were pushing you know technology into existence. Software abstractions pull abundance into existence, right? It's like before, you know, we were pushing on the rope to try to move it. Now we're starting to learn to pull on the rope, right? This is a very, very different way of doing innovation and funding innovation that is quite distinct from before. So remember, it's like this, what's happening is we've created this new kind of capital, right? This software capital that is pulling along the hardware, right? It's pulling along the production capital that gets pulled into existence in software's wake. Now, it can be from a third party, right? It can be Uber is like pulling along all the cars and drivers for UberX. It can be first party, right? Apple makes their own iPhones after all, which have to continuously get better in order to meet the increasingly high expectations placed on it by iOS and iOS users. Or it can be a mixture of first and third party, right? So Amazon is a good example of this. Uh, it's very good at pitting it, its third party merchants and its third party service providers like UBS not only against each other, but also against Amazon's own products and their own infrastructure, all underneath this incredible abstraction, which is like Amazon Prime and one-click buy. You can be a two-year-old child and learn how to use one-click buy. 
And then this incredibly sophisticated army of hardware across the world will mobilize to deliver whatever it is that your two-year-old accidentally bought to you in toy parks, right? It's really remarkable. So the second special thing about software, which again, is not new to software, but software helped to really flourish our networks, right? You know, this idea that on the internet, when there is very little cost of finding people and serving the N plus one customer, this idea that you can have software that becomes more powerful and more valuable as users join and use the network. So, you know, I'm also using the word network pretty broadly here to mean anything that has network effects. And so aggregators and platforms, bundles and marketplaces and various kinds. So this combo of apps, so basically all the buzzwords that people use when they come and pitch startups, right? You know, entrepreneurs learn real fast. <laughs> what <Yes. does. laughs> So like this combo of abstract networks, right? I'm going to use existing hardware to do more jobs for more people. And the more people that join, the more useful it would be, creates this incredible amount of pull in the form of demand for everybody and everything that is serving that network. So like, let's take a minute to actually just contrast this old setup versus the new setup we just described. In the old setup, if I wanted to invest into innovation, financial capital, you know, from investors and their money needs to be invested into technological R&D. And then that R&D had to make its way translate into production capital. And then that production capital has to produce. And then finally, we get the ground truth, right? Users take out their wallets and do or don't become paying customers, right? And then money makes its way all the way back to investors in the form of real profit. And then the investors are finally made whole. So before, again, it's like from the investor's point of view, it's like investing into innovation is like pushing on a rope, right? You're throwing money into this tech uncertainty and market uncertainty, and it takes a bubble or some strong outside force like the government to actually mobilize enough capital to break through into this new paradigm. In the new setup, though, it is completely rearranged. I can invest into an abstraction that sits directly next to the user. It takes this users that is here now and have all kinds of jobs they want to do now, right? And say, okay, how can I reshape what's already available in order to do this job for you and then force that production capital to evolve in order to meet the increasing demands that I can place on it? Everybody should picture, like, you know, pic imagine picturing like a little diagram and a piece of paper where it's like going from left to right. It used to be financial capital invested into companies that made things that went to users. Now it's like going from right to left. It's like users can interact with a network that then take things out of the production capital, right? So we've rearranged things pretty substantially. So when I build sort of this asset light software company, the software network, I can get immediate feedback from users as to whether what I'm doing is working or not, as I and benefit from network effects, and then have all of the hardware follow me. Now, so remember how all that uncertainty and that sort of delay between investment and return was like slack in the rope, where before that slack in the rope was our enemy? Now it has some become sort of paradoxically our friend right? It's more time to do experiments. It's more time to learn about your users. It's more time to grow your user base while you're not worrying about profitability yet. You're worried about growing your user base yet. This is how Silicon Valley works, right? It's this place for doing experiments where people are optimizing for a number of chances to get it right and for absolute magnitude of success should one happen. Investors in Silicon Valley no longer need to underwrite based on, you know, cost of capital to return on invested capital, which, you know, in the early days of a startup life, there's like truly no useful information. What you underwrite on now is CAC to LTV. What does it cost me to acquire a customer? And what is that customer worth to me in the long run, right? Especially if, you know, it is subscription revenue, which has become this sort of darling of tech, you know, companies for exactly this reason. So like in this new setup, right, what is scarce? Like in the old way, it was very clear what was scarce, right? It was like the units of production were what was scarce. It was whatever it is I was making in the factory that was scarce, right? And my ratio of cost of capital to return on capital was how I measured scarcity. If I own something scarce, scarce then capital will be available for cheap, and I'll be able to generate a lot of return on it. Now, it's like this has migrated to the other side, right? It's Now it's users are what is scarce, right? And I measure scarcity in CAC to LTV, right? If I own something truly scarce, then my users will cost me less to acquire, and they'll have a very high and defensible lifetime value. Is that, is like, that sympathetic to uh, or, or similar to you know Ben Thompson's aggregation theory that you know, now it's yes? Yeah, okay, I'm glad you said that. So aggregation theory gets like 
some of this right. So ag aggregation theory is a really good summary of everything we've said so far, actually, right? It's like, if you own all the users, right, because you're Google or because you're Amazon, it's like, you're not going to charge them the exorbitant rent. You're going to charge everybody else who wants to get at those users and sell them goods and services or serve them ads or whatever it might be. This is like in the old setup, right? Monopoly businesses made money by charging customers, you know, for attractive profits. Now it's monopoly business make money by charging everybody else heinous profits and then passing a lot of savings onto the consumer, right? It's like, it's no wonder like consumers love Google and Amazon for the most part. And for people who are like, consumers actually hate Google and Amazon. It's like, no, that's valuable, yeah. right? Like people love them. It's like, so Ben Thompson's aggregation theory and especially his series that he did, you know, several months ago on like antitrust, I think does a very good job of explaining this new flip, right? Of who gets to charge attractive profits. But it also does stop short of a more radical conclusion that we're about to get to actually about what is driving this. And this is, this is my one sort of major critique of Ben Thompson. Uh, I think he's fantastic. It's super high quality. You know, I read him. I think the one sort of flaw in the way that Ben sees the world is he thinks too rationally about what everybody does, right? I think Ben sees the world in terms of like, if everybody is thinking clearly, here's what they will do. But it's like, actually, like, as we will see in a second, a lot of this behavior is not driven by cold, rational return on investment. It is driven by something else. And here's where we get back to Peter Thiel land. So, you know, again, the fun part is just like before, right? We have this, like, we have this scenario where it's like the Bay Area is proof that like this model works, right? Software is eating the world, right? Everything is networks now. Everything is subscription revenue now. Everything is CAC to LTV now. Abstract software networks are like these backwards, you know, funhouse mirror images of regular companies that actually build things, right? Instead of a balance sheet built on capital that continually turns over and generates return as it makes stuff, they're built on balance sheets of customers that continually turn over and generate LTV. Now, here's the fun part. Like before, it's like this positive feedback cycle that's driving the tech industry forward is also built on an interesting lie, right? So remember, like before, it was like the lie that drove bubbles over was this idea of, oh, we're all investing into the future as if what I'm buying is return on invested capital. It's like, no, it's BS, right? You're not investing, you are speculating, right? And just like before, the lie at the heart of Silicon Valley now reveals this new kind of conflict that's driving this positive feedback cycle that makes the whole thing go. So, you know, today, if you go to San Francisco, if you go to Palo Alto, it's like, what is everybody fighting over? Well, we're fighting over users, right? Companies are fighting for user growth and investors are fighting to invest into the companies that are growing users fastest, right? If you ask today, where is the bubble? The bubble is in CAC. Right, the bubble is in cost of acquiring customers. People and businesses are spending crazy amounts of money on customer acquisition cost, with kind of a hope and a prayer of making that money back through LTV realized as actual economic profit. But the real reason why we're spending so much money on CAC is because we're being valued on user growth. Right, their user growth is what makes them able to raise money. Their user growth is what makes them good acquisition targets. Right, because if you are growing, then you are a threat to large incumbents, and they may have to acquire you. Right. It makes you valuable and it makes you worth funding. Now remember, so like, let's put our Peter Thiel hats on. Intensity of conflict does not tell us anything about the value of the prize. It only tells us about the intensity of the participants. Right. So like we have these crazy scenarios around valuation and user growth that make this strange kind of very Shakespearean sense. Right. Like look at WhatsApp. Was WhatsApp really worth, you know, $19 billion or whatever their acquisition price was? Well, like, yes, right? It may not have worth, been worth $19 billion to the public markets, right? They earned almost no, their, their only revenue was like charging users $1 to join right. something. Like, they, they have no revenue, right? It's like, they were not worth $19 billion to the public markets, but, but they were worth $19 billion to Facebook. Why? Well, because it was worth $19 billion to Facebook for Google not to have them, right? right. This, is, this is very Shakespearean, right? It's like, oh, it's like, to a random person, this has not very much value, but it has value to me because it has value to you. And given that it has value to you, I'm going to pay a lot for it to make sure that you don't get it. <laughs> right? <laughs> it's like, this, so what happens is an extreme example. But it's like, again, the, the old lie was like, previously, it was like the big lie that financiers t told was about cost of capital versus return on invested capital, right? Like, we're investing. It's like, no, you're not. You're speculating, right? You're paying X cost in the hopes that six months later, somebody else will pay 2X cost. 
right? Return has nothing to do with it. Today, the big lie that entrepreneurs and their VCs tell is about CAC versus LTV, right? It's like, we're spending money on user growth to increase our cumulative LTV. Like, you're, you say you're doing that. Really, what you're doing is speculating. But instead of speculating on capital, you're speculating on user growth, right? You're paying X cost to acquire a customer in the hope that someone later, you know, future funding VCs, large acquirers, maybe even the public markets, will pay 2x for that customer. We pay lip service to LTV, but really it's just about customer acquisition because somebody else is going to buy us and those users anyway, right? Or they don't even have to, but they or they could, right? Which is enough to keep the valuation up and keep my supply of cheap capital coming in such that I can actually have a shot at building a really good business, right? It's, like, it's this lie that keeps up and keeps up, but it works, right? It's like if you understand the lie, you can get to the heart of why a lot of this works. It's like we have to keep telling this lie because we need these valuations to stay high. Right. It makes everything work. And the valuations, if you were to actually soberly value all these businesses based on real LTV conservatively, based on what we can tell, it's like, no, you wouldn't get anything close to these valuations. But it doesn't matter because we're speculating on somebody else's willingness to pay an even higher price per acquired user in the next funding round. SoftBank. Right? And it works. SoftBank can come in and be Kingmaker, right? Or it doesn't even have to be SoftBank. It just can be like large mutual funds can come in. Remember a couple of years ago, it was like Kiro Price came in and like did all these investment rounds. And then everybody looked at, you know, companies, whether they're getting marked up or marked down per quarter until people realized that didn't matter. So again, so what's important about this is that like in the end, we also get to abundance, right? But we get there in a really different way. In the old is like we, it's like we created these bubbles and they pushed tech and S curves into abundance, right? Now what's happening is that we are going from scarcity to abstraction, and then that abstraction is pulling into abundance into being, right? Users are pulling everything along. They're pulling the capital investment along. They're pulling the hardware along. They're pulling the whole third-party ecosystem along. And one day you look around and you realize, oh, it has worked. It's really, really interesting. So again, it's like you can think of it as like up until relatively recently, we knew how to do push innovation. Right. But we didn't know how to do pull innovation. Now it's like we've learned this other way to economically allocate capital into the future, which is this idea of investing in a software abstraction and then pulling everything along. Right. Like I think that's really, really cool because it gives us this complementary way of saying, OK, we do not know what the future is going to be. And we have to invest in it with people's money that is not ours and to whom we owe a fiduciary responsibility. So how are we going to invest in this stuff anyway? Well, like, these are the answers, right? It's like we are kind of innovating on how to innovate, right? We've learned how to pull the rope, right? All based on this sort of like, yeah, it used to be that it, we had to pull this very speculative lie around, you know, cac uh, around the cost of capital to return on capital in order to make capital cheaper, 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 in order to put it in the hands of entrepreneurs. Now it's like we've recreated this whole same kind of idea, but on the customer side. It's like, Customers have become what is scarce. CAC to LTV has become this new equation by which we evaluate the engine of these startups and whether they're working or not. And everybody says that they are buying LTV when we invest into a company. But really, it's like you're paying a certain amount for a cost per user because we believe that in the future, those users will be even more valuable, either to us or someone else. And so re-summarizing a little bit, you know, now it's, it's uh, aggregation theory, users matter, users are, are scarce, the big lie. Is, is around mm -hmm. CAC. Um, uh, back then, you know, pre, you know, uh, Web 2.0, it was uh, capital is scarce. Um, I, you know, re summarize pre aggregation theory and how that change happened, evolution happened. Yeah. So, again, I guess like it's like before software, right? It's like what was scarce was the unit of production. Right. And if you want, so the unit of production might have been like a factory that makes cars or a railroad that transports people or electricity that you use to power your house or whatever it might be. And the way that it's like in that critical period where after we had discovered this new technology, but before and during its actual deployment and like build that into the world, the way that we were able to actually allocate dollars into this thing was it had to be by pushing it forward through, right? There was no other way to do it. Now, like with software and with the internet and with abstractions and with networks, it's like you no longer have to, it's like, Instead of saying, I'm going to invest all this money into hardware and then like hope that the hardware works and hope that users use the hardware, I can say, I'm just going to make an abstraction on top of hardware that already has. And I'm going to get all the users because I believe they want this abstraction. And then I'm going to 
because I own all the users, force all of the hardware or force all of the third parties or force everybody else to then come along with me. And I will steal all of their attractive economic profits. And the way that I am going to keep up this attractive position is by passing on most of those attractive economic profits to my users, right, in the form of surplus. Right? Again, this is why people love Google. They're getting a phenomenal deal. Right? This is why people love Uber. They're getting a phenomenal deal. Right? It is much less good for the production capital, right? For the businesses on the other side of the API. It can suck a lot. Right? But this is this new state of being we've made. Now, by the way, so before we go into the next section, I think what's interesting about this is that I think in the last sort of, sort of post-1999-2000, when you had sort of this next era of company building that I think really was sort of defined by Facebook as like the biggest example of like, oh, we're going to move fast, and we're going to break things, we're going to make these abstractions, we're just going to grow users, we're going to like create this incredible network of users, and then that will make us super valuable, and then that on its own will give us this titanic power and then shape the world around us. It's kind of the epitome of pole innovation. I think what's happening now is like now we're seeing all of these other new projects that people are working on that are actually like that are quite capital intensive, that are very sort of these heavy businesses that are not just sort of light social networks or light search engines or things like that. It's driverless cars, right? It's lots of biology. It's lots of projects that do need huge amounts of dollars to go in and are going to get truthfully pushed through because it's way, way, way too early to be able to actually put them in front of users. What's cool about that is that these projects are largely being funded by the tech giants themselves. This is really neat. It's like, why is it that it makes sense? So it's like, it, like, so Facebook aside, it's like, it genuinely makes sense for Apple to be working on self-driving cars and for Google to be working on self-driving cars and for Amazon to be working on self-driving cars and for Uber to be working on self-driving cars for that matter, even though all their businesses are really different because what they have in common is they own lots of users, right? It's like, if we can actually successfully stuff all this capital in and create these big technological breakthroughs, it's like, we know we will be able to put them to work. Like that, it's like, I don't think that's a surprise to anybody, right? If Apple actually can build a self-driving car that works, they will have no problem making money off of it, right? Same for any of these things, right? So it creates this new way of closing the loop and saying, like, all right, like, here is a great way of recycling all of these incredible profits that we are making on the back of this innovation that we've successfully pulled forward, now we're going to recycle that into more things that might be harder, right? And then further cement this position by saying, all right, now we're going to deeply vertically integrate into these very, very, very hard technical areas because we and we alone have the capital and the patience and the perspective to be able to now start to push, you know, capital dollars through. Totally. Right. This is what makes these big tech giants so scary. Right. It's the prospect that they might be able to pull and push at the same time. Right. Same with SoftBank. Right. They can pull and push, given that they also own all these networks. VC backed startups are legitimately a very big threat to these giants, but we can only pull. Right. We can't push. We don't command, you know, tens of billions of R and D capital. Right. Google does. <laughs> right. But we don't. So I mean, what, another way of summarizing a part of what you mentioned is it used to be that. Consumers paid the rent, uh, capital reaped the surplus. Now production capital pays the rent, consumers reap the surplus. Somewhat thanks totally. to Red, Red Queen's race. I, I think the, mm-hmm. uh, but one, one thing we, we talked about earlier is you mentioned that, you know, there's so much consumer surplus, but some of that dividend ends up inflating the price of positional goods like housing and college degrees. It shows up in, in different areas. Can you talk a little bit about that phenomenon? Oh boy. It's like an interesting corollary of all this is, and this is, this is a bit of my own speculation. So don't take this too much to the bank, but it's something that I've been thinking and worrying about for a little while is, okay, people over the last 20 to 25 years have been wondering about, have these two twin things they've been worrying about. Thing one is, Hey, our productivity, like at least measured on the basis of technology and our ability to do more with less with computers and with the internet and all this stuff is going up year after year after year. Why aren't we all rich, right? Why are we all still working five-day weeks, right? Why are large numbers of people still, like, struggling to afford, you know, living expenses and make the rent, right? Like, why hasn't all of this consumer surplus that we should be getting making us live these lives of leisure? And then mirroring that, we have the second thing we wonder, which is, boy, housing prices have been going up faster than the rate productivity growth and GDP growth for the last very long time on average. Why hasn't this corrected itself? 
And same, why have college degree prices gone up more and more and more and more and more? It's like, how is it that we afford to keep paying these things? And I can't help but wonder that it's like the productivity dividend and the sort of like the, the, the peace dividend surplus that is given being given back to consumers every year steadily by software and by the whole tech industry is for a brief period of time does make people wealthier. But it immediately gets eaten up by something called positional scarcity goods, which is a really, I think, this is sort of a, a broader topic of discussion, which is when, you know, the goods that are naturally scarce become abundantly available, right? You know, when our food is all abundantly available and our water is all abundantly available and our shelter is all abundantly available and our transportation is all abundantly available and whatever, what becomes scarce? It's like what becomes scarce are you know, kinds of scarcity where the value of what we have is defined strictly in relation to what other people have, right? So it's like, as an example, it's like, imagine that you are standing in line at an amusement park and you're all waiting in line and it sucks and you pay $10 to go to the front of the line. Like, wow, amazing. Like that $10, that front of the line jump is worth so much to me. Well, if everybody else does the same thing, then it is no longer worth anything to you, right? Your the value of the ticket only has value in relation to what other people have, right? Similarly, it's like, let's say that you were in a school of friends and you want to show off, so you buy a nice watch, right? Let's say you buy a nice Rolex or something, and you feel awesome. You're like, wow, I spent $10,000 on this watch. I have no idea how much a Rolex actually costs, but $10,000 sounds reasonable, <laughs> like some exorbitant amount. I spent $10,000 on this fancy watch. Like, like, oh, I'm so cool. This is doing my job for me. And then, like, your friend shows up with an even more expensive watch. He shows up with a Patek Philippe or something. And, like, now you're like, oh, man, like... My Rolex is no longer doing it for me. Now I have to buy a more expensive one. Like it's a positional scarcity. Now, the problem with positional scarcity, so things like, it's like, with like, hey, I have to pay this. I am willing to pay whatever it takes to bring me up on the list, right? And if other people pay more to leapfrog me, then I have to pay more to leapfrog them, right? The problem with positional scarcity is it has the ability to consume basically an unlimited amount of our resources. Like the only thing that can stop positional scarcity from eating up like all of this money, if we care about it, is that like eventually we run out of money. The most extreme and like widespread example of this, and the one that's honestly the biggest threat to everything, is housing crisis. Right? This should be no surprise to anybody who has ever been to the Bay Area or you know any major city, which is that prices of housing in major cities and major hubs has just gotten completely out of control. Right. Because what you're buying is this positional good around things like one is like you want to live in certain neighborhoods. But like the more mundane explanation is honestly things like traffic. Right. It's like you have to live within a certain radius of where everything is going on. And if somebody else moves in earlier than you, then they are going to be in front of you on the highway. Right. So you create and especially in a in a regime like San Francisco's where we are not building any new housing. Right. It creates this terrible effect where it is able to consume almost an unlimited amount of our money, right? For the desire to be like, oh, like I have to be in here because other people are here. And because other people are here, I have to pay more. And this is why housing prices can get bid up more and more and more and more and more. It's like, it's not because of any underlying value, right? It is not because of any economic productivity that the land generates. It's because the role of the land is to exclude other people from being on it. Same thing with a college degree. It's like, if you want to spend $50,000 a year to go to Stanford, right? It's because most people do not go to Stanford, right? And you have purchased some, something that is positionally scarce, right? Now, if somebody else, you know, if all of a sudden there were like 20,000 people were admit, admitted to Stanford, it's like the price of that Stanford degree would probably go down or the price of the Harvard degree or whatever would go up all relatively speaking, right? It's like you're just buying a place in line that only has value relative to other people's place in line. Now, the, the, what sucks about this is that I really do worry that so, you know, uh, land and housing prices and rents and college education is another one where it's just like these types of ac accelerating costs of positional goods are just going to eat up all of the, you know, economic gains that we are trying to deliver to people, right? It's like tech industry is delivering this fantastic wealth in the form of surplus to people all over the place. But... One, it's doing so at the expense of all of the workers and all the production capital and all the, you know, goods and services and industries that actually do the real work. So like, that's not so great. And two, the gains, that, like, you know, the, the, the dividend that is given to us in the form of we pay less money for more stuff 
is eaten up by the fact that our disposable income now has, just has to go into paying college tuition or just has to go into rents that are getting higher every year. We don't actually get to enjoy any of the, any of the benefits to it. It just goes to the landlord, right? It's like meet the new landlord, same as the old landlord, right? It hasn't changed. In, in conclusion, I think that sucks. Yes. Um, it's, like, it's like if you care about the impact of tech on inequality and prosperity and well-being and general civic happiness – it's like, that is what I would pay attention to, right, for people. It's like, figure out what to do about all these positionally scarce goods that are eating up all of the good, you know, surplus that's getting created. And this, this is what people talk about when they talk about cost disease, right? Or elements of that? When they talk about oh, cost disease, so it can be. I mean, cost disease is interesting. So cost disease, I think, does describe many aspects of people using to talk about um, higher education a lot. Like, why is it that college degree costs more and more every year? And I think that's a big element to it. So when people talk about cost disease, I think, so cost disease or, or Baumol's cost disease for people who aren't familiar is this observation that there are certain subsectors of goods and services, the most infamous of which being healthcare, that tends to get more and more expensive every year, you know, as opposed to the general trend of goods and services, which should either, you know, stay the same or get less expensive as we make technology gains and efficiencies and things like that, right? So the price of, you know, a trip to the ER room gets more expensive every year. A college diploma gets more expensive every year. In the case of healthcare, right, I don't think too – I think healthcare is a genuine case of cost disease that has to do with all kinds of complicated factors because healthcare is insane in the United States. I mean, I'm Canadian, so we have single-payer healthcare that works, so blame me. But again, healthcare in the United States is just – you know, you should talk to you know our healthcare partner at Social Capital, Kristen Bakerstone, about this. She will educate you all day and knows everything, uh, and I do not. But for something like education, it's like, yes, I do actually believe that there is a component of education, of higher education, that is getting more expensive every year. Because if you look around college campuses, it's like the amenities that are being provided are getting stupidly nice. And like the dorms are looking really nice. And like there genuinely does appear, at least to my uninformed eye, like there is more money being spent genuinely on delivering this experience. But I also think that... I that too, like, comes back down to a positional thing because it's like people go on college campus tours and they're like, which one looks more prestigious? And it's like, well, it's the one with the nicer stuff, right? Like, I do, I do think it's all part of just making sure that, like, you keep your ranking up, right? Making sure that, like, if I was number 49 last year in U.S. News and World Report ranking, then I can't dip back below 50, right? And if other people spend more money on new squash courts, then I have to spend new money on new squash courts or something. So that, so in this way, I think that, like, I think that uh, positional scarcity accounts for an element of Baumol's cost disease. For real estate, I don't think there's any Baumol's cost disease there at all, because the cost of building a house has stayed about the same, right? So again, in order to actually look at the real cost of building a house, you have to look at the cost of building a house in an empty field in South Dakota, right? Somewhere where the price of the land is not very high, and the price of building a house will mostly just be the cost of building a house. Right. If you look there, so outside of in cities where you have land and zoning and all this complicated stuff, yeah, the price of building a house has stayed more or less constant for the last couple of decades. It has not inflated. What's inflating is, one, the price of land. Right. That's not a cost disease phenomenon. That's not some big mystery. Right. It's just straight up positional scarcity. And the second thing is, like, it's more expensive to get permits. It's more expensive to do bureaucracy. It's more expensive to do zoning. That has a cost as easy element to it, but mostly I just think it's like, well, the world is more complicated and it gets slower, right? That's just how governments and bureaucracies work, right? It's like the more complicated, more entrenched they get, they just got to become more costly to use. You know, that's not new. Zooming out, did we do enough justice to your you know, concept of, of emergent behavior and how Silicon Valley is an example, or did we cover it via other means? Oh, I, th I think we I think we talked about it a bunch. Uh, I think just when, when you when you think about emergent behavior, just as a general rule, I think it was fun is to say like, let's like is is like what on its own would not exist if it were just like an isolated small number of people, right? Like for instance, like bubbles are not a phenomenon that happens because of one person. They are a collective hallucination that happens because everybody is all getting in on something. Like, again, this whole idea of us creating these insanely inflated CAC to LTV ratios because that is what keeps valuations high and high valuations are what makes these companies dangerous because they can raise money and keep growing and therefore have to get acquired. They're justifying those insane valuations, right? It's like that is an emergent phenomenon. Speaking about mass hallucinations, by the way, we probably do have to talk about cryptocurrency. <laughs> well, I was about to get. I was about to get it. I was about, I was we nice do segment. have to talk about Bitcoin if we're going to talk about network 
networks and monetizing networks. I, uh, I, was, yeah. I was about to segue. I was going to say we mentioned <laughs> earlier uh, how, you know, people are, you know, there's so much consumer surplus by, by Google and Amazon and Facebook, uh, uh, you know, and people outside of the Valley uh, or the average person you know, loves it. But at the same time, we're so scared of those networks because of, because of their ability to, you know, pull and push, you know, mm. enter crypto. <laughs> you know, a lot of people are saying that they're trying to, crypto can fix some of the, these problems. Where, where do you see it? <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> Let me, let me, let me, let me ask you this, Eric. Let me, let me flip the question a little bit. So you've had a lot of people, you know, come on the show. You've talked a lot about crypto. What do you think is the range of the spread of people in terms of overall bullishness versus bearishness on crypto? And then part two would be, how do you think they separate between what they feel is important, right? Do you have like, in terms of some people are over on the, oh, like, what matters is good cryptography, right? You don't, it doesn't need to have a token. It doesn't need to be public proof of work, right? What matters is good cryptography. And that, you know, can be what you call, whether you call it a private blockchain or whatever. Then you have other people who are like, no, what matters is that this is a new way to monetize networks, right? This is, you know, this is the Chris Dixon piece on uh, the business model for open source, right? This is everything Balaji writes. This is, you know, this whole way of like, this is a new economic phenomenon. What overall is sort of the spread of your guests and their overall enthusiasm, and how has that changed in the last, you know, period of time? <laughs> yeah, well, I'll, I'll generalize a little bit in in that they fall into into two camps, and some people are are in both, but the people I've had on typically tend to be in one or the other. One is the the sound money camp, which is mm-hmm. you know, oh you know, yeah, sorry, I forgot about that camp. Yeah, that's yeah. only a third camp that matters. My yeah. apologies to all of you. <laughs> don't don't dox me. Totally. <laughs> yeah, that's the, that's the worst crew to upset. Yeah, that's yeah, true. And, and that's the loudest crew. You know, Bitcoin yeah. maximalists. Uh, you mm-hmm. know, money that can't be controlled by government. Governments can't yeah. inflate, confiscate money. And this, you know, sort of going back to the golden era of the gold standard. And I would say that is most in vogue right now with uh, with mm-hmm. the prices dropping and, and a lot of projects. <laughs> it, it, we've reversed from like blockchain, not Bitcoin to Bitcoin, not blockchain. Not blockchain. Yeah. Um, and now <laughs> it's you're a contrarian. If you're if you're bullish on ETH right now or bu- bu- and even just blockchain applications, you're not super loud because there haven't been any yet. Or even uh, aside well, from- so full full, dis- full disclosure is uh, I am still long ETH, but that partially <laughs> may be due to the fact that I lost my two factor on Coinbase when I got a new phone, <laughs> so I can't sell it even if I want to. Right, exactly. So there's your di- there's your disclosures. There's your disclosure form. Totally, so your skin <laughs> in the game yes. attributions. Totally. Okay, so like let me do this. It's like we should pause for a moment and appreciate that if it turns out that this whole idea of Bitcoin and blockchains and tokens as a way of, you know, storing and capturing value, like the whole, what, what started as this big Bitcoin vision that has since grown into everything. If it turns out to have been a giant hallucination by everybody, right? If that's what it turns out happens, you know, 30 years from now, we look back at this, then you could not have invented a more perfect way of articulating the particular way in which the internet has changed the way we think about making bets on things, right? I would like to point that out. Like, even if Bitcoin goes to zero, even if everything goes to zero, we will have learned something super interesting, which is, if you think about, so this is like, I've drawn this on many whiteboards. So audience, try to imagine this with me. Imagine I'm drawing sort of a a line from left to right, which is going to be an axis. And on the left-hand side of the axis is going to be I want to invest money betting that the future will be like the present. And then on the right-hand side is I want to invest money betting that the future will be unlike the present, right? So, you know, on one side, you've got Warren Buffett. On the other side, you've got Mark Andreessen, more or less. Now you look and you say, okay, what is going to be the mechanism by which I will, you know, invest, right? What is the, what is the right method of capital allocation? Well, if you're betting that the future is going to be like the present, right? I bet that the future is well understood. I bet I understand the parameters of the future. I bet I understand to a reasonable degree what my risks are. Then the way that you invest money into that future is debt, right? You lend, right? Lending is, right? It's like you expose yourself to some unknown unknowns, but for the most part, it's like it's going to be the lowest cost of capital. It is the highest volume way. It's the way that you bet saying, I think I understand what I'm doing. I'm going to lend at such and such rate. Now, if you move a little bit farther to the right, so still in the territory of I understand what's going on, but I'd like to capture a little bit of the possible upside. Now you're into value investing territory, right? So you're, you're Buffett, you're Munger, you own some railroads and Geico, 
you understand very well right, what it is these businesses do, but you'd like to capture the upside of them there. Now let's say you walk a little bit more to the right and you look into growth investing. Right Now you are not paying for real cash flows that exist today. You're paying for future cash flows. Right? You're saying like, oh, I'd like future profit. Right? I'd like this future profitability that doesn't exist today, but I bet will in the future. Right? This is more like betting on tech companies. Right? It's if you own stock in Amazon, right? It's like they are not issuing dividends, right? But their stock keeps going up and up and up because they could be, right? Because their free cash flow is going up. So this is growth investing, right? If you look at a little bit more to the right, right, you start to get like companies that are like more wild tech companies. You start to get to the Teslas of the world where it's like, if you buy a share in Tesla, especially right now, it's like, what exactly is it that you own? It's like, well, you own a piece of Elon Musk, right? And you own the collective <laughs> backing of everybody else who believes in Elon Musk, right? It's like, I highly recommend you don't look at the at any kind of <laughs> balance, like, like fines, because it looks like a dumpster fire. But if you believe, <laughs> then it is a great way to put your money behind him because he is this unbelievable entrepreneur, right? So we're moving more and more and more to the right, right? In terms of like, I believe the future will be not like the present. And that's why I am backing Elon Musk. As opposed to, you know, Buffett or somebody like that. Like, it makes sense. Again, the more you think the future is going to be radically different, the more it makes sense to bet on a guy like him. And now, finally, it's like we've reached the logical end of the spectrum, which I believe are these, like, ultra-reflexive crypto coins, like Bitcoin, where it's like, if you buy Bitcoin, there is, like, like, there are no cash flows at all, right? There's no underlying value at all, right? It's not like you're saying, like, oh, I own the right to future debt or I own the right to future, you know, like, profit. No, you own nothing. You own a piece of reflexivity, right? You own a piece of incarnated reflexivity that is worth whatever tomorrow's guy is willing to pay for it, right? Due to the fact that there is only going to be 21 million of them, right? And there is some scarce to supply and that people might use it for reason, whatever, whatever. But basically, it's like what you own is a piece of reflexivity. So this, in many ways, is like even more potent than equity as a tool for investing into things that are trying to become bootstrapped, right? Things like networks. Like this is the, the, the Chris Dixon thesis that uh, I thought was very well written, right? This idea that like tokens are a na- could be a native way of funding networks in a way that bootstraps them. I think, by the way, as an aside, the problem with that point of view is that it only works if you don't do a massive ICO. <laughs> Right. See, I was completely ruined that dynamic. This is like, all right, now you got a ton of tokens, and it was for people who did not do any productive work at bootstrapping the network. It's just speculators, right? right. So I think that's worth being mine. Anyway, anyway, where I was going, what I wanted to wrap up with this is that, like, this whole idea of, like, oh, hey, you know, a token as the native financial unit of the open source network is kind of like the perfect internet idea. It may be too crazy. It may not work. It may collapse for all these reasons. I hope it doesn't, right? But, like, even if it turns out it does collapse, it will have been a fantastically revealing idea in terms of the direction that the Internet is taking in terms of how we think about value creation and how we think about weighing future versus present value, right? And starting to really, you know, pay for not the zeroth derivative of profit or the first derivative of profit, but really now, like, the second derivative profit is where we're starting to go in with these coins so that in a sense is cool yeah and how does like what's scarce in, in this world or what, what's the aggregation theory application or how are we innovating <laughs> on how to innovate here <laughs> i mean if you find out you tell me i think we had uh, the joel i think so joel Monegro's uh fat protocol post had a good run for a couple of years until it got brutally you know torn down by the angry internet mob of you know <laughs> bitcoin posters what, like a month ago or something like that? They had their yeah. field day with those, like, no, it's the fat money's, you know, pieces yeah. now or whatever. I think, so, like, right now, it's like, well, it's too early to know for anything aside from Bitcoin because we don't know how anything aside from Bitcoin is going to be used, right? In all honesty, I think the only one where we can say anything about it is with Bitcoin itself because it sort of reflexively is that, like, the token's, like, value is the value of the token. Right? It's like it doesn't actually do anything other than be valuable. So in that sense, I think you can actually like take some initiatives and to say like, well, like here are the sets of circumstances in which I would expect this to gain and hold money. Right? It's like again, Bitcoin works. Right? We have actually worked out that Bitcoin works as designed. 
Now, there are a million problems that have resulted as a result of Bitcoin working, right? Like people are getting scammed everywhere and it's, you know, you're creating all these secondary problems with respect to bad behavior and also it's killing trees and destroying the environment. Like, yeah, like there, there are a lot of costs where what we don't know at this point is, is the value that Bitcoin brings to us worth the cost that we get everywhere. But we have worked out that it does work, right? So in this case, with respect to Bitcoin specifically, I think the value of Bitcoin and what it can hold is actually basically just going to converge to a cost versus benefits of what people are willing to pay, right? And that's kind of scary, but it shouldn't depend on too many other things. Like it's going to be, it's, it'll be like gold. With everything else though, like, like what is going to be the value of an Ethereum token? If there are this many people building D apps on top of Ethereum as opposed to whatever, it's like, we have no earthly idea how that is going to shake out. We truly do not, right? I love the people who are putting out those laws for like, I, okay, maybe you can help me out with this. Somebody made like this rule that was supposed to be like the law of like what the price of a token was supposed to be. That was basically PV equals NRT, like the ideal gas law. It's like if this, there are this many tokens and it's at this pressure and it's at this temperature where temperature equals inflow of money and pressure equals the hash rate. Or, I don't know. <laughs> it, was, it was something crazy where it was like, it's literally like somebody who like pointed to a 10 textbook. It was like, I remember that. Yeah. Like it's PV equals NRT. It's like, no, you just made that up. But, but it probably got, you know, a hundred thousand likes. I don't know. Yeah. Like, look, that's clever. <laughs> I don't know. We're yeah, definitely still trying to figure idea. out, you know, valuation <clears throat> of, of these things. I think, you know, one thing people say is, you know, your, your, con- you know, or Mark Andreessen's concept of software is eating, eating the world. And, and your sort of, uh, you know, addition to that is not that the whole world is going to be made of software, but that the whole world is going to start behaving more like software. I'm curious yeah. if, if crypto brings, is it like markets and everything? And just like, how does it, that change or does it just accelerate what's already happening? Or remember, so you, you had this this uh, thesis that was put forward by Parker, right? Which is the idea of like, if this works, it will suck all the value out of everything. Yes, right. It's like, well, listen. If you want to look for the villain that is sucking all the all of the margin out of everything, it's like, let me introduce you to uh, Amazon. <laughs> like, you don't need a blockchain for that. What you need is like a supremely executed platform business that then sucks away every margin out of everything and returns it in the form of consumer surplus. It's like, because I trust Amazon, right? It's like, AWS is the villain that people are saying that these blockchains are, if that is the thing you're worried about, right? right. I think part of the reason why people say that, though, like, it's it sort of, it's like, I say that, like, happened, yes. In seriousness, no, I think you have a lot of people who say, like, oh, my God, if we actually figure out distributed trust, right, then this whole industry that is built on trust will all go away, and that's some massive sector of the economy, like that will result in GDP destruction or something. It's like, well, first of all, like blockchains do not provide trust, right? They provide proof, which is not the same thing as trust. Second of all, like you do not need a blockchain for this. It's like if you what you're worried about is like, oh, like better proof is going to eliminate a lot of middlemanery. Well, like you don't need blockchain for that. You just need good cryptography. And that fortunately is something that is happening in the background anyway. Right. There are awesome teams of security people and awesome cryptographers who do not do any blockchain related work, who are actually making profound progress on this kind of thing, just in terms of our ability to trust each other and remove friction in a, you know, way that maintains integrity out of any kind of transaction or any kind of interaction. You do not need a blockchain for that kind of stuff. What ha- may happen in the reverse, however, is what happens when you introduce, you know, tokens into the, the equation and when you start talking about public to- you know, public blockchains and whether it's on proof of work or whether it's on proof of stake or in any of these open source systems where, like, the token itself and the value of the token and the pursuit of that token in incentivizing minor behavior or whatever is integral to the, is, you know, crucial to the integrity of the network. It's like, now you've just introduced so much mess to clean up. It's like, I am not worried about it being net GDP value destruction ever, right? Like you just introduced so many problems to this scenario we're going to have to clean up and it may all totally be like net positive, right? I'm actually pretty excited about this stuff. I think it's good, but I think you can sort of put it this way. It's like somebody told me this once. I can't remember who it was, but it's like there are two kinds of people who think a lot about software. The first kind thinks that software in the long run means less lawyers. And the second one thinks that software in the long run means more lawyers. (laughs) 
I think I'm. I think I used to be in camp one, but now I'm in camp two. The longer I spend around and stuff. And so Which one would you say you are? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm still figuring that. Let me, let me try to understand, unpack that analogy more. So, say say what that means for there to be more lawyers, and, and what what shifted for you? So, okay, so the software means less lawyers versus software meaning more lawyers. I think so. Again, it was it was said kind of half uh, in jest, but this idea of like, oh, like. Tech makes things more like efficient and it is very precise and it eliminates a lot of uncertainty because it's digital and precise, you know, whatever that means. I'm using the word precision here, tongue in cheek on purpose, right? Because it's like people who look at software and they're like, oh, it makes things very exact. And that therefore must create a lot of resolution and like non-conflict. It's like, no, (laughs) the exact opposite happens, right? More information creates more conflict, right? Not less. It's like, yes, if you create, you know, a version of the digital, like, look at fake news, right? It's like, people are like, oh, well, with the internet, we'll be able to validate whether things are real, like, in real time. It's like, or actually, you'll have a hundred different competing versions of the truth, right? It's like, a hundred percent, the second one is what happens. So you need, like, in the end, it's like, it, it's like, imagine it saying, like, pre-software, it's like, yeah, it's like you needed to have lawyers because people, you needed to figure out what was correct and like what was agreed upon. With software, it's like, yes, you get a lot of efficiencies in terms of you get a lot of precision and you get a lot of fidelity in copying numbers and pasting them back and forth. But the problem is that you have now a thousand times as many numbers, right? So it's like, in the end, we made a lot of work for lawyers. <laughs> back to Parker's argument for a second. I'm trying to st- yeah. steel man it. So I think he's saying, yeah. hey, you know, take something like Dropbox and, and, and Filecoin. Uh-huh. Dropbox is a uh, you know middleman. You know, it's a ten billion dollar company. Or whatever, you know whatever it is now. They uh, I did famously say that they were going to die. Yes, so I may not be that. the world's foremost expert on this. Yes, <laughs> totally. So <laughs> you, um, well, I think you were right about Slack. Hi, Dropbox. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so uh, I think Parker would say something like, "Hey, if if Filecoin, if we're really discerning your meeting middlemen here, wouldn't that value mostly be passed on to consumers? Like, wouldn't it be a smaller market, but Filecoin captures all of it? Like, what makes us think that?" Your file coins is going to be worth $10 billion. Like, and it is, is it a better world if it's actually worth like $200 million? Okay. Well, I guess I would put it this way. It's like one, I feel like Dropbox itself like passes on a ton of value to its customers, right? Like Dropbox is a fantastic product and you get a lot from it. Right. It's right. There's a spectrum. Much, right. It's like, it's like, but let's make sure that our reference point is set correctly, right. which is that Dropbox is this really useful service. It eliminates a lot of friction that previously you would have to pay a lot more for or experience a lot of pain for, and they make it available to you for very cheap. Now, with Filecoin, it's like, is our prediction with Filecoin that it will be like that, but even more so? I'm not sure. Like, Filecoin has to do a lot more work than Dropbox does, right? It's like... The cost of decentralized, you know, porn storage or whatever's on there is going to be significantly higher than the cost of Dropbox being able to do it all in a technologically sensible, centralized way, right? Like Filecoin has to have, I, I, okay, I, I don't honestly know exactly how Filecoin does their stuff. I assume it works. Uh, but it's like, I would think that there is a very large and considerable ongoing expense associated with making Filecoin actually function. Right. And this idea is like, oh, well, that expense is, you know, like captured in the sense that Filecoin charges people to use it. And the value that it creates is captured in, you know, whoever own, has ownership of the tokens of Filecoin's networks. Like, that's true, but it's also expensive to operate. Right. And yeah. there are going to be huge amounts of secondary problems in the periphery if Filecoin actually works. Right. So again, and like those problems, like legal problems, I assume, bear a cost of their own. So it's like, yes, in the end, there will be winners and there will be losers. But my bet is net that Filecoin, by virtue of being more expensive to actually operate than Dropbox, again, I suspect there are people who claim that Filecoin can actually be even more like operating efficient than Dropbox. And if that's true, cool. I would love to see why you think that. That could theoretically change my mind. I just kind of doubt it. Like, no, of course, Dropbox is going to be more efficient than Filecoin is. The point of Filecoin is not to be efficient, right? It's to be distributed to be, it's to be Filecoin. Even if what, if, if blockchain was this magical thing that everyone, everyone sort of ascribes all these, uh, characteristics to, I think just, you know, in the ma- like macro economic principle, I think what Parker's arguing, again, I'm just trying to steal Amanda's argument here is that true disruption means, you know, even, even on the spectrum, just more value passed on to consumers and less quote unquote <laughs> rent, rent seeking. Yeah. I take no issue with that aspect of the argument. I think where I take issue is the idea that like all these blockchain startups are going to be 
more of that than software in general, that I'm not convinced of. It's like, I will 100% give him the argument that software companies do that in general, right? right? I am not convinced that decentralized, you know, public tokenized networks will do that more than the traditional networks we know now. I'm not convinced of that yet. Let, let's say you were, hypothetically. <laughs> and okay. if, sure. If were, we, we, uh, we, okay. Would the Alex Danko argument then be, but, you know, value will then, like, recenter, like, scarcity and abundance will, like, reshuffle? Like, if it's true disruption, there will be new winners, like, elsewhere on the value stack? Oh, always, right? I will think that forever, right? That's one thing that it would be very hard for me to change my mind on, right? Is that if you eliminate scarcity in one place, it will show up somewhere else, right? And it can be very hard to understand where that is until it emerges one day, right? It's it's an emerging phenomenon, right? If you if you worked at Kodak, right, and you were witnessing the fall of film camera sales because of digital cameras, right? You, it would, you would go through many false starts of thinking, okay, like, where is the new scarcity, right? Is it in the cameras themselves? No, not really. The cost of them seems to be dropping and dropping. Is it in the memory? Like, no, that seems to be dropping. Is it in online photo storage and sharing? No, not really. People don't, oh, we got it. It's advertising. And Instagram is going to be worth hundreds of billion dollars, right? It's like, all the, it's like, we went from Kodak being a photography company that was worth lots of money to Instagram being a photography company that was worth lots of money, right? And in the end, there were many false starts of like, what's going to be the really valuable company, given that we know that photographs are a really important part of people's lives, right? Which they are, right? That never changed. It just took a while, right? There were lots of bad guesses. Let's look at an industry and maybe apply some of these, some of these principles that, that you've, you know, that you've really explored. Maybe... Synthetic biology or maybe transportation sure. or agriculture. W- which one would you prefer to, to get to? Transportation is pretty topical right now because of all the scooter licenses. Okay, and let's all the, the drama that's been going on. Why don't we talk about scooters? Okay. So transportation, I think this is, I think transportation is really fascinating right now because we're in this interesting sort of pre, pre-war period with respect to driverless cars, right? It's like, they're going to happen. They're not going to happen yet. It's going to be some period of time before they happen. So everything is sort of like stirring and waiting and jockeying into position while we figure out what's going on. And then you have these sort of bursts of excitement, like the scooters, like all descend on San Francisco and like a band, right? And everybody's sort of trying to figure out what is this new model for transportation, right? What's it going to look like? I do think that so driverless cars are going to, one, be just, you know, a phenomenally huge driver of economic transformation, right? It's, it's it's really hard to overstate how big a deal they're going to be, and also how potentially they're going to ruin things, right, if we're not careful. Uh, I know that there are some people who are like, you know, Benedict Evans has a really good point about um, how it's like, oh, like, driverless cars move things from circuit switching to packet switching, right? And that is like a profoundly different transformation. Like, that's really important. But it's like, yeah, there are all sorts of ways it could work out. Maybe I'm a little bit of a pessimist here, but I feel like it also caused a lot of problems. But anyway, that aside, what I can say I think for sure will happen with transportation and with driverless cars and with transportation as a service more generally is it is going to be driven hugely by whatever is the engine that creates very low cost capital to build out all of the tremendous amount of infrastructure that is going to be required to actually execute on this. So that doesn't necessarily just mean cars or, you know, better technology. It also means things like roads, right? Things like specialized proprietary roads for these things or rebuilding the infrastructure of what makes cities work, rebuilding, you know, like the access points and the parking and the charging and all kind of stuff. That is going to consume an enormous amount of capital. And what's going to matter is what is the positive feedback engine that is going to unlock all that capital. Well, if it were 100 years ago, we would have said, well, it's going to be like a bubble, right? It's going to be a big sort of like a money supply driven bubble. It's going to be capital is going to get really cheap as everything piles into this thing. Now we have another level of more sophistication. So circling back on our conversation from earlier, right? It's like, well, a lot of this is going to be subject to people trying to buy into these networks, right? Like Uber, right? Saying like, hey, Is it really all that important if Uber actually builds a self-driving car if they have all the customers? Or is it actually crucially important that they build the self-driving car even though we don't have customers, right? And all these things. We will see, right? It's going to be really, really interesting as everybody tries to jockey for position. What's cool, though, is that 
what is going to happen over the next several decades, you know, with the with the cars is playing out in miniature with the bikes and the scooters. Right. This is why I think this is so fun. Right. And this this little theater of the absurd going on with, you know, San Francisco banning all the scooters and then going to two companies and then issuing them scooter medallions. Right. It's like how, you know, poetically perfect is this? Right. Like this is this should be a Shakespearean story about how we abandoned all the taxi drivers and like made their medallions become worthless. But then we created new medallions to a company that actually has no labor involved. Right. Right? So they're just truly pointless. It's like a taxi medallion is like, yeah, you want to preserve people's like I get you want to preserve people's right to earn a living and their income and things like that. Scooters there's just no reason. There's just absolutely no reason other than spite. Right. So but yeah, it's like it's 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 quite Shakespearean. Yes. So anyway, I do yeah, I do think that like all these sort of dynamics with like bubbles driving like lower cost of capital, that capital being put to work in all these interesting ways as we experiment and try to build all these new things is playing out in many ways in miniature, whether it's here or whether it's in China with all these interesting new abilities and service things or, you know, anywhere else. Like look at what's going on in the small, right? It's like the past is prologue. And I believe, I really, really believe that in all these ways. So it's been, it's been really fun to watch. You know, earlier we were talking about how governments have been underrated in some of this, you know, obviously innovation as to the internet and software Crypto enthusiasts will often talk about markets can solve market failures, better markets can solve market failures, and we don't really need governments. And in fact, they will have less power because they don't control the money supply if Bitcoin, you know, actually works out. How, how do you I told them about- send an army to your door and say, <laughs> give me your private keys, and then right. you give them your private keys. <laughs> right. but, but that aside. How do you, yeah. Even separate from the, from the like pipe dream, how do you think about like the role of government in fostering innovation in, in the future? Is it sort of a get out of the way type thing? Is it something else? like, what are your thoughts? Okay. So that, that, I mean, that's, there, there are all kinds of aspects of this question I think are important. So again, as, as, as a Canadian, you know, who grew up in the United States, but now lives in Toronto, I think it is really important to see a lot of the ways in which the Canadian style of government that is a little bit more hands on, has a little bit more of a safety net than the United States has effects that are both Good and bad, honestly, with respect to our ability to foster innovation. It is a true statement, I believe, that if you are an ambitious entrepreneur, the best place for you to be is in the United States. And part of the reason why the best place for you to be in the United States is that we have a government and we have a culture and we have an environment that really supports risk taking in all kinds of ways relative to other countries. Right. But for example, it's like, look at, you know, bankruptcy laws, right? It's like, if you were in the United States and you go bankrupt, you can start again. And it is at least more okay than in other places. Like if you're in Europe, you go bankrupt, your life is over, right? It is just a very, very different environment and tolerance towards that kind of thing. So if you're an entrepreneur, it's like, yes, the United States is definitely where you should, where you should be or possibly China. Although I honestly don't know enough about China to be able to speak intelligently about China and the way that government works with tech there. Although it's a whole interesting story that I just want to learn more about. But I think that te- I think that the government has a very critical role to play here in acknowledging that, as we talked about before, something important has happened with respect to the way that the future gets built. A lot of the work of future building can and in some ways should get offloaded onto these private companies like the Googles and the Ubers of the world, because they are doing an unbelievable job at building the future, right? They really are. I think it would be an enormous shame for the government to come in and say, we're going to impose handicaps and punishments and curtail your ability to innovate and build the future because we don't like the you know inequality that it may be driving locally, or we don't like your, your behavior is another story in one of those companies' cases. Or, or, or just because we don't like, because there is general anti-tech sentiment, we don't like the monopolies that you're becoming, right? We don't like you having the power that states have. I think that would be a real shame. It's important for governments to acknowledge that these companies are very good at building the future. However, I think what the role of government should be is saying, these companies, like, once they, once they, like, earn their stranglehold on all these users, like, once they become these aggregator dominants, they should not be the only options. Right. They should not become the only game in town to get all these services like there should be whether it's publicly funded options or other ways, you know, for users to get goods and services or users to, you know, be able to interact with the world in all these ways where I think governments and especially local governments have an important role to play, especially as we get into the world of the tangible, tangible and physical like with driverless cars. And 
I do think actually that, so this is, this can be a subject for another podcast, but I think there is actually an organizational model that is already here, does not need to be reinvented, that can actually play a very meaningful solution to a lot of the problems that we're going to have in the 20th, 21st century, right? We have these problems which are networks are becoming too powerful. If it's only these big private tech network, tech networks, then their bad problems will happen. It's like, well, we need to have another kind of network that can be either publicly run or subsidized or otherwise accountable to people that can serve as these alternate ways of organizing assets and exposing them to people as a way to use. And that organizational structure are co-ops, right? Co-ops in the form of building co-ops or agriculture co-ops or nursing co-ops or all kinds of co-ops are a surprisingly huge part of the United States economy today. Right. They are almost completely out of the mind share of the tech industry out in the valley. It's not something that we really care about, but they have done an unbelievable job at giving us more with less for all kinds of goods and services at very high quality in regulated ways for 150 years. Right. This could end up being a very 19th century solution to a 21st century problem in the sense of saying one way that the government can help is by saying, okay, the job of figuring out the future and of building up that future is very well left to these tech giants because they are good at moving fast and building stuff. But once we do know, like once we do have an understanding of, okay, here's how this you know ecosystem is playing out. Here's how driverless cars are now starting to settle out. Here's how this world is starting to settle out to say, all right, the role of the government is to now make sure that there are now many options for you to get what you're going to do. The role of the government is to support these local co-ops initiatives. The goal of the government is not to punish, but rather to support many different versions of people coming together and organizing into networks such that they can compete with each other. Right? That, I think, is a good role of government. That is something that we should see a government as something where they can positively act to make these things come together. And I am actually relatively encouraged that such things are, in fact, happening right now. So we'll see. We'll have to revisit this in 10, 20 years, you know, or, or sometime later on, we can do another episode. But I do think that's something that's important. Totally. And can you just give, give one quick example you, said, you mentioned it's happening out? Like, what, what is the, the manifestation of that playing out? One example of co-ops that does a really interesting job is in agricultural co-ops. So if you, know, if you learn anything about agriculture, you know, as we've been doing over in Social Capital and on the Discover team, is that you immediately learn that it is, like, you, I think a lot of people on the outside are like, oh, the reason why American agriculture is so productive is because we have a very free market attitude towards ag. It's like, that could not be further from the truth. Like, agriculture is not a, a free market in the way that Adam Smith intended it, right? It is this incredibly complex and broke hodgepodge of regulations and subsidies and local cooperatives and arcane rules combined with really, really mission-critical work, right? It's like, if Google goes down, people don't get to search today. And it's, it's, if Slack goes down, which happens every couple of weeks, people just move on Twitter and that's where they do their slacking, right? It's like, LOL, this sucks, but it's fine. If agriculture goes down, like people don't eat, right? Is, is mission critical in the sense that in tech we should be more appreciative of. Co-ops in agriculture, both at the grower level, at the distribution level, at the consumer level, at all kinds of these levels, have provided these incredible networks that have served as a buoy and as a ballast against this overall trend of margins eroding for founders and driving all of their agricultural practices into the dust and creating sort of terrible um, unpaid externalities. These agricultural co-ops are actually very sophisticated in their way of organizing large numbers of people and assets and otherwise important resources into these collective, not, not just collective bargaining units, but really collective acting units that let them do more than the sum of their parts in terms of the way that ag functions. Now, so they are, on the one sense, kind of under assault from the internet in terms of like the, the, the internet is really reshaping the way that a lot of interaction takes place in agriculture, but it's also reinforcing the importance of these kinds of networks that are aside from these big sort of company driven, you know, like, if, you, if anybody knows about Farmer's Business Network, this is a great example. You can look at Farmer's Business Network and the half support, half backlash that is generated is a great microcosm about the way that agriculture is changing the way that, way that farming works. But I do think that in the future, there will be a lot of solutions around that kind of thing of these sort of member owned, again, member owned co-ops, maybe on the blockchain with their own token, wink, wink, nudge, whatever, uh -huh. <laughs> that will play important roles in the future that is actually right up the government's alley to support in really good and important ways when necessary.
Totally. Zooming out a little bit, um, and I asked you know, a few questions. W- one is, how does all this, what we talked about today, you know, scarcity, abundance, you know, emergence, h- how does this make us better, better investors, better venture capitalists? So when we think about, you know, what is it that we are here doing, right, as VCs, you know, as stewards of capital that we want to put to work building important, meaningful companies? I do think that, again, sort of like at, at Social Capital and on the Discover team where I'm on, we really hold this very deeply, that we should not be trivial about this idea of like, oh, like money can go be anything and it's Silicon Valley, so everything is kind of abstract and murky and you just want to grow a bunch of users and then they'll eventually turn into something that's important. It's like, no, we have to be really thoughtful about what it is we are setting out to build, right? And about what change we want to help see in the world and how we want to go allocate our capital deliberately right, to go make that happen. Uh, so a couple, to, to give you an example, so last week, Jay Zaveri, whom I work with at Social Capital, you know, the partner who I work with, tweeted out a list of 40 hard problems. And this is an actual list we have that we wanted to share out with the world that says, hey, here are 40 hard problems that we care about. If you are interested in solving these 40 hard problems and have insight into the way that technology might transform these problems or might create new kinds of solutions, right, please get in touch. The reason why we care about this is because we have at our fingertips, you know, in San Francisco, in Silicon Valley, in the tech industry, this incredible distributed, bizarre machine for transforming scarcity into abundance, right? We do. We really do. And we have to figure out whether one of our values is going to be steering it in the direction deliberately towards some of these problems, like air quality and water quality, or like access to more affordable health care or reforestation and, you know, better forest cover in the context of climate change or into issues looking at cities and the way that cities plan and grow for people. All kinds of really interesting, difficult problems that are not necessarily in the Silicon Valley wheelhouse yet, but ought to be. I think looking at things in terms of if such, you know, if something is still scarce, right, if clean drinking water is still scarce for people in Flint, Michigan and in Detroit, like with this school year just now, then why is that? This is not a, uh, this is not something we have been able to fix yet. Why not? What would it take for us to be able to turn that into a software problem, right? Where we can change it with the skills that we have and the tools that we have. We're not ready to do it, but it might take something. So I think that's what I'll leave you with this idea is like as investors, we should really think about this. And it doesn't have to be everybody's MO, right? If you want to go and say, listen, you know, my job is not to rescue the world. My job is to make capital for my limited, make money for my limited partners. That's totally okay, right? That's 100% fine. That is your job description. But I do think that for people who want to deliberately go and say, this is something I care about, this is part of my mandate, you should be thinking in terms of what is still scarce, right? That software cannot act on. What is still causing harm and injustice in the world that is a problem, right? How might we be thoughtful about bringing something into a way where we can start to work on it, right? Where start, software can start to eat its way into that problem and create some more prosperity and share on it. I think that's something that we can all do. No, love that. Another question I want to ask is on the concept of um, users are the scarce resource as it relates to like, are there similarities as it relates to like careers, like pers- personal careers and as, how people think about your know, scarcity, abundance or, or value capture you know, as software and web has become critical? That's an interesting question. Let me give you a good answer to that question next time. But I have one, I, I do have one like mini answer to this, which has like as, as in terms of, you know, scarcity and in terms of users and in terms of making things that are useful and abundant for people. And that is for a particular type of, you know, young person earlier in their career who have high potential, but who may be lost. And that is grad students. I, so I personally believe that like right now, grad students, whether in the life sciences or whether in the hard sciences, or if you're a PhD student or if you're a postdoc or wherever you are, are some of the most underutilized and, you know, underpaid, underappreciated people out there. And we ought to be doing a better job in the tech industry at reaching out to those people and be saying like, guys, 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 right? We want to work with you in solving these problems because you are the smartest you are ever going to be and have the most energy you are ever going to be. Don't like, like, come, like, some of you need to come on board with us, right? We need to do a better job of doing outreach there. And part of the reason why I think in grad school and in a lot of these sort of points of view in university and in early schooling is that 
you learn a lot about this idea of originality, right? Oh, like my goal is to produce research or, and it's to be the first at discovering something or, Hey, my goal is to be, you know, to really publish things that advance novelty of things, right? And then you might learn a little bit about this idea of patentability and intellectual property sort of as this afterthought. Nowhere in grad school did I ever hear the word user, right? User was a foreign word to me. This idea that like you wanted to build things for the people who would be using the outputs of our labor for and our efforts and our scientific curiosity from their point of view, right? That is something where I think, one, more people in that particular career path when they're think, saying like, hey, like, do I want to go into research? Do I want to go into academia? Do I want to go into some world where I use my creativity to go discover things? Is to say, hey, we need to make a better, we need to do a better job in Silicon Valley of reaching out to those people and saying, hey, what you are missing is this culture and appreciation for building things for the user. And this is what we are good at. This is where we can help. If you want to join up with us, we will help teach you what we know about users and how to build good software and how to build good products with what you know about this incredibly important problem and technology in the world, whatever it is, right? Whatever it is, your area of expertise. So it's like, one, cause once you understand how to think about users, it's like you start to get a better appreciation of saying like, Oh, okay, here's actually some way that I can make a dent in some sort of scarcity that's useful as opposed to saying, Oh, what I care about is novelty. Like novelty doesn't mean anything. Novelty is meaningless. Right. Novelty does not mean that anybody cares. Right. Like what matters is building something that actually makes forward impact in the world for you, I hope. Yeah, I, so I hope that I know that didn't answer your question really, but it's for a particular person, which is, you know, anybody like like me who had been in grad school or anybody who is there now and is wondering, like, what should I do? You know, how can I make some sort of impact that is productive? I would urge you to give that a thought. Totally. I, I have this uh, sort of emerging thesis, which is that, you know, if you look at brand assets like, you know, uh, specific knowledge and skills or strong network or slash fame, like, you know, access, like distribution, you know, things like ca uh, financial capital, um, that in the past, you know, things like financial capital and network used to have more value than they do today in the sense that specific knowledge, if one has specific knowledge and skill sets, the others can be built a lot quicker. Whereas like specific knowledge and, and skills will get you money and network and, and fame much quicker than money, network, and fame will get you specific knowledge and skill sets. Uh, and they're always, they're bottlenecks. It's sort of like there are four legs on a stool, but the one stool that is specific knowledge and skill sets is the one that's the most important or, or the compounds the most. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. <laughs> Uh, I mean, I do. I mean, I'm really, really excited to see what is happening with some initiatives like Lambda School. Um, I don't know if you've been following any of just the incredible just screenshots of early results and gratitude and love that is pouring out of this early community. Lambda School, by the way, so it's, it's this initiative by Austin Allred that was started relatively recently of like, hey, like, did you sort of not go to college or going to college late or somehow not in sort of the if, if you do want to relearn how to code or relearn CS, you know, at, at any point where you don't have a traditional college degree, come to Lambda School. We will subsidize the cost of your education hugely. And in return, you can pay us back out of the difference between what your salary was before and what your salary is now. Right. It's great. It's it. so early results are coming back and it appears to be just this unbelievable success where people are like, Hey, like I learned all this stuff. I went, they helped me get a job. They helped me with this community. And now I went from making, you know, family making $38,000 a year to now making $95,000 a year after eight months of investment of getting these particular skills were in demand. And then Lambda School helping me going out and get a job, right? In a lot of these areas of the United States or of the world where like they might actually really be in demand because there isn't a strong, you know, software coder base there or something like that to me is just so, so, so cool. This idea that like it, with a couple tweaks, we can really bring a lot of these skills that you say to places where they're needed. That to me is just very cool and heartwarming to see. Totally. And, uh, future of education in, in another episode. Two, just last quick questions and, and maybe there's, there's nothing to go off of. But one is, I'm curious how you think about, you know, what, what is positive sum versus what, what things are zero sum? Like what, what is the relationship between the, between those things? Cause I, I think we have a lot of assumptions about things that are zero sum or things that, that are positive sum and they affect how we approach those, those different worlds. That's one big question. The other question is, are there any moats? In venture capital <laughs> and how you think about mo Ooh. moats generally. Okay. Any of those? So uh, first, first question. So, you know, what's positive sum versus what's zero sum? I think that in terms of like 
natural resources and things in the world that we consume, it's like, well, like we're very clever at making stuff and turning it into other stuff. Right. You know, it used to be that lots of different natural resources were scarce and then we learned how to make them out of coal or out of petroleum or something. And then oil became scarce. And now we're learning how to get energy from other like sources that are non oil and things like that. It's like we're very clever. Right. It's like, yes, at the end of the day, I know we're limited by like the second law of thermodynamics and stuff like that. But like, come on, that's not really what we're talking about here. I do believe that like as far as it comes to natural things and natural resources and natural things that we consume and use, I do believe that we at least have the potential, not the inevitability, but the potential to innovate our way out of most things by creating, you know, more abundance with more cleverness. I think that that aspect of the world is more positive some than we get, than we think it does not mean it's necessarily a guarantee we will accomplish it. Like we could still screw it up. Absolutely. And we're not on a great trajectory right now, but there is cause for good news. I think what is not positive some, right, is related to our discussion earlier about positional scarcity, right? This idea of like anything where its value is proportional to where I am in line relative to you. That is just very zero sum and it's very pernicious. And I really do worry that like it is going to consume more and more of our resources and our well-being is going to go into whoever are the owners of those positional scarcity, whether it is land, like in the literal sense, our landlords or otherwise, right? Or, you know, people who are administering, you know, things like not higher education because they tend to be nonprofits, but still it's like, you know, land is a great example, right? It would be a pretty crappy outcome if, you know, 100 years hence, we did all this incredible work in creating all these new abundances, and then we were not that much richer off because everything just ended up converging back to these positional scarcities where traditional landlords ex extracted the same traditional rent that they've extracted since the beginning of time, right? In the end, we all came back to the very beginning, which was a relatively small number of people owning the thing that we got to char charge rent off of everybody else, right? That stinks. I don't want that to happen. Uh, I think that people in software should, although not necessarily hold themselves to blame for this happening, uh, keep it in the back of their mind, right? As an outcome we don't want. Totally. Moats and venture capital. That's interesting. I think if you look at sort of the job that the VCs do in terms of not just providing you with uh, money and with advice, but also with providing you with, you know, with a brand and providing you with credibility and providing you with a certain kind of momentum. Like, yes, there is absolutely a success begets returns to success dynamic in the venture capital world. I think there's no surprise there. What's interesting about VC right now is that, you know, there are more startups than ever before, right? There's more startups, there's more ideas, there's more entrepreneurs, there's more funding, there's more of everything. And as a result... We're in this interesting world where, although exits has not kept up, right, which is certainly the case, or is like there's definitely like a case of like more in than out right now. There's also net more interesting stuff being done everywhere, right? And I think the places where all of those good things are going to be done everywhere are going to be everywhere else in the world except for in the United States, right? That I think is sort of tremendously cool. So social capital has an initiative called capital as a service that you may have you know seen or heard about that is, you know, autom automating and democratizing access to early stage capital in places around the world, starting with Brazil as the first officially launched market, where we really believe, um, you know, it's like, it's not true that there's too much money in venture. It's not true that there are too many startups. It's just that like, we are being very narrow minded if we only look here, right? To me, in the past, the moats around venture capital were really these returns to what did your reputation locally mean? What was your success locally? Like, what, how many tombstones for like IPOs are on your shelf and how can you use that to raise bigger funds and get bigger brands? Like, that's genuinely a moat, right? In addition to just, you know, being good at your jobs, right? No amount of like moat theory will explain why benchmark is best, right? They're just the best, right? You don't have to overanalyze that one. But I do think that in the future, one of the important moats in VC will be this ability to deploy capital in all kinds of other ways, whether it is different geographies or different types of companies or different types of founders, where it is very difficult for traditional venture capital to be able to mobilize in that way, right? So this could mean internationally. It could mean at different either earlier stages or different types of companies, right? It could mean a lot of companies that traditionally sort of got shunned by venture capital because 
they were not like immediately analyzable from a CAC to LTV point of view, but we're still building really good businesses. It might mean, yeah, the ability to use data more intelligently than other people in order to build a data advantage, right? In a way that Google is able to build a data advantage over understanding, you know, links and search and news, right? That could be in the future. I do think that a lot of these moats, though, in the future are not going to be the same as the moats today because the game of venture capital is changing to respond to not only, you know, like more money in people like SoftBank and the, you know, large mega fund trend that's emerging, but also towards like the very, very real competition that is new entrants like AWS, right? The fact that companies can now get started with less money, with more power and more tools. If you think about what VCs do, right, it's like we sell entrepreneurs tools to win. Right, entrepreneurs are our customers. If entrepreneurs can get those tools to win from somebody else for better or cheaper than we can give them to the entrepreneur, then we're being beaten. If that person is, a, if that entity who can sell entrepreneurs those tools to win is AWS, then it means we're competing with AWS. Uh oh, right? That should be a wake up call. And I think people are waking up to it. You know, at Social Capital, we certainly spend a lot of time thinking about the dynamics of the future way that entrepreneurs are going to win and who is going to sell them those tools, right? And I think all of venture capital is going to wake up eventually and realize like, hey, our competitors are not just other VC firms, right? Our competitors is anyone who can bring them those tools. And the moats that are going to be emerged is going to affect that new reality. It's going to be global. It's going to be every entrepreneur everywhere. And it's going to be really interesting to see happen. 100%. And it's interesting to watch how it's evolved over time. You think like, you know, first around the platform team and then Andreessen with the services, you know, which sort of like quadrupling down on, on the platform, like human strategy yeah. and then things. Why yeah. come there for that matter? Right. Yeah. Like there, you know, there, there, there is, I think just honestly, goodness, a success story of this idea of you have to build a machine that builds a machine. We will see what happens in this phase of Y Combinator, but there's no denying that's like, well, they picked an approach and like, that was it. And uh, my question is, is the next Y Combinator going to look like Y Combinator are going to look, you know, typically doesn't, but I don't, I don't know the Mandarin uh, characters for Y Combinator, but <laughs> <laughs> totally. there's, there's your answer. Totally. Awesome. Uh, cool. I'm, I'm going to be sensitive to your time. This has been a fantastic, uh, fantastic episode. Thanks so much for coming on. Sure, thank you very much for having me. And thanks so much to uh, listeners. Uh, if you have any, if you want to argue yeah. about any of this, if you take issue with any of it, if you want to have a discussion, if you think I'm right, if you think I'm wrong, Go talk to me on the Twitter website. Yes. Uh, you can find me at Alex underscore Dinko. That's A-L-E-X underscore D-A-N-C-O on the bad website. And by that, I mean Twitter. I'm more than happy there to go stir some stuff up online. And any, uh, any hope you really enjoyed it. And thanks so much again, Eric, for having me on. Any last plugs? Re read snippets. It's awesome. The media yeah, we read snippets. Uh, I do a newsletter that comes out every Sunday. Uh, it's pretty good, I think. Um, you should subscribe to it. If you go to socialcapital.com slash subscribe to snippets, uh, you can put your name in and you will get email from me every Sunday. Awesome. I love it. I've read every single one. Uh, Alex, Excellent. thanks so much. I'll talk to you soon. Eric, thanks so much. 